not allow violence against this house. Don't come in here. Welcome to Cornwall, setting for one of the most raw, controversial and unruly slices of modern cinema, the classic British Western Straw Dogs. Up this track toward that farmhouse would come not only the coupling crisis of the narrative pursued by a bloodthirsty mob, but also a director in crisis, Sam Peckinpah, fated for the ultra-violence of the Wild Bunch, but sadly overlooked for the lyrical beauty of the Ballad of Cable Hogue. It's in that farmhouse that Peckinpah would do battle not only with his own inner demons, but also with the cast and crew who joined him on this violent West Country crusade. Come on, gentlemen, drink up. Let me have the glasses, please. Dear Sam, rehearsed the same scene over and over and over again. I kept saying to David Goodman, the writer, when is he going to get to the other stuff, like the stuff with me and Susan George? And, you know, and the scene he kept rehearsing over and over again was a bar scene, and I think it wound up in a fight. We felt that we were at the ends of the earth. And I think because of that, we all behaved rather as if we were at the ends of the earth. Straw Dogs was made at a time when the boundaries of mainstream cinema were changing, when films like the X-rated Midnight Cowboy, which dealt with male prostitution and rape, could win the Academy Award for Best Picture, and Stanley Kubrick could be internationally fated for testing the limits of violence in A Clockwork Orange. It was against this background that Sam Peckinpah, an American director working in England, mounted his rape revenge classic. Cinema was becoming challenging, dealing with previously taboo subjects, and few films were more challenging than Straw Dogs. And we run into storms and rain and wind for the first two weeks. And so all the pub shots, not scenes, were shot in the first two weeks. By all accounts, the first two weeks of shooting Straw Dogs were little short of disastrous. For one thing, the original lighting cameraman, Brian Probin, found it virtually impossible to shoot in the confines of that small building where the interiors of the pub scenes were being shot. And they looked at the rushes, and after the first week, he went. The first assistant backed the cameraman, and uh, a few people walked off or they were sacked. I don't know, I didn't get into the details. I watched them on the set for a week, and uh, he was drinking heavily and wasn't completely in control of what he was doing. I looked at the rushes and they weren't very good and I felt we had a problem. There was talk about you even replacing Sam um, and Marty Baum to his credit was the one who said you know we hired Sam we will stick with Sam and we will we will continue with him. The people who were financing the film were horrified because Sam's reputation at that point was one of being irresponsible, of going over schedules, but mostly of being very difficult to work with, all of which I found to be a wonderful challenge. <laughs> the whole thing, the whole business, was turning us into what he called his British Wild Bunch. And uh, I think he was quite successful at that, actually. I think one of the reasons why Sam did Straw Dogs was when he, if he was going to be taken out of his own environment, which is America and the Western, which is what basically what he did prior to coming to England, that he would choose a topic that he could, in his mind, consider a Western, but just in a different location. And I think he saw Straw Dogs as a Western set in Cornwall. Straw Dogs began life as a novel entitled The Siege of Trencher's Farm, which Scottish writer Gordon Williams had knocked off in a matter of days. The story of a man, a woman and a child holed up in a besieged farmhouse in a dark corner of England. This nuts and bolts thriller was optioned by Hollywood producer Dan Melnick, who enlisted David Z. Goodman to pen a screenplay which would become the first draft script of Sam Peckinpah's West Country Western. I had already been hired, Sam agreed to that, had never met me. And he asked me to do Straw Dogs, which was based on a novel called The Siege of Trenches Farm, <coughs> uh, which I read and uh, which I did not like. I'd moved with my wife and our two first children to Devon, some idea of the rose-covered cottage, the sunshine. We had the third child, and the ambulance got lost between 
Oakhampton in our cottage, which was seven miles. So it dawned on me that um, you wouldn't be much use phoning the police. But then I thought, what would make anybody want to attack this house, supposing I had to defend it? Why would anybody? Then I thought up oh, circumstances, and, um, and then I thought up this American. In fact, the American was a mistyping. I typed an A instead of E, which was worth a lot of money, that little typing mistake. Uh, Gordon Williams, who wrote the book upon which this film is based, has complained publicly that the film is nothing like the book. I think Mr. Williams <laughs> has a penchant for uh, his own work. I don't. Peckinpah hated the novel. He described it famously as reading it as being like drowning in your own vomit. And I've never read the book, so maybe, maybe you could drown in your own puke. I don't, I don't want to risk it. This uh, siege of Trenches Farm, which I said I would do if we could make it more meaningful for me, and this was to put in an anti-war sort of situation. The man was going back with his wife to a small town because he couldn't take uh, the tensions and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I was aware of the duplicity within myself. I was against the war, and yet violence attracted me also. And I thought maybe I could put that into the character. And in the process of trying to find a way to get this way in, that this character would be very much against violence, uh, find what had happened obviously abhorrent. Either he was at a school like Kent State uh, or, or at that school itself in the, what we call backstory, and had suddenly said, this country is too violent, I am taking a sabbatical, and I am out of here. Was you involved in it, sir? I mean, did you take part? See anybody get knifed? Just between commercials. And what attracted me was playing a character that is running away from the external problem, but not the internal problem. So that ultimately, the irony would be he would have to face his own demons and his own repressed attraction for violence. I liked Sam, and I do feel that he was an artist, but I was upset that once we got going, and particularly after we rehearsed that bar scene about 19, 20 times, that it wasn't malicious, but he was not going to attack these nuances. He, he, he just seemed to be involved in shooting Sam's movie. Dustin Hoffman was prodding me to fire Sam. I felt there was something wrong with him, physically. He had his substance uh, problem, and uh, I think it started in the morning with his coffee. I probably was an enabler in that regard because I would always prepare his coffee in the morning and there were always two coffee um, containers, one with brandy and one without. Well, you see, the thing with the, the, the Peck and Paul pictures was there was a lot of drinking by a lot of people. So a lot of the time, I don't think people noticed. I was asleep one night in the hotel, three o'clock in the morning. My door to the bedroom was disintegrated. I'm looking, I'm silhouetted in the door with Sam with a headband, his poncho, and a bottle of Kawasaki. He said, get the fuck up. He said, we're going to Land's End. He said, you got the car keys? We're going to shower the moon. It was very poetic. Which he was. Eventually got there, and it's pitch black. You, you could hear the sea hitting every bit, and then about two minutes later, you'd get the <laughs> soaked. Cavassier was getting passed between the two of us. He's going, This is fucking great, and it's pitch black. We got back. I dropped Sam off where he was staying, sort of grabbed the bath. We had it been location at half seven or something. Sam didn't. He'd got pneumonia. <laughs> Suddenly we were told, I think it was the end of the second week, the film's going to close down for two weeks. A little guy with a cigar came up to me and said, do you know any good directors in town? But it was decided that Sam was very sick, which he was, he had walking pneumonia, um, that we would stop shooting, we would get the insurance, and um, Sam would be able to go and recover and come back. And I told him that he had two weeks to get himself in shape. No drinking, no carrying on like, like he did before. He got to straighten up and do the job. And one of the older actors, Peter Vaughan, I think it was, he said, we won't, we, won't, we won't be coming back on this. So I just 
think I rang my agent and I said, you can forget this because I, I don't think we're going to go back. But we did. Well, maybe we welcome you to the West Country, Mr. Second I Park. adore it. I really, I like it. I even like the weather. Thank you very Despite much. Despite the fact that I almost died of pneumonia here. The exteriors for Straw Dogs were shot in freezing conditions in the early part of 1971 here in St. Burium, about five miles away from Land's End. Well, they took down all the television masts, had taken off all the road markings. They tried to turn us into a mean, backward village. I don't think they quite succeeded. They had two beautiful, brand new Triumph stags delivered, took them out to the blacksmith and said, beat them up. <laughs> And he said, I can't do that to a new car, but he did. I said, Sam, uh, how about a, an exciting action prop? Where do we put it, Mr. Sumner? Oh, here in the back. Oh, it's heavy, Mr. Sumner. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I recently bought myself a man trap. He said, what's a man trap? And I explained to him how they were used for poachers. Sam saw it and said, wow, that's great. And that's how the man trap got into uh, straw dogs. When you get on location, actors are actors, actresses are actresses, and they're shop talk in the bar and the restaurant in the evening, and everyone gets around the world, everyone. Uh, Susan George and Dustin Hoffman got on very well together. They had a lovely, jokey relationship. And uh, Susan I've worked with before on uh, a couple of films. Oh, she was lovely. She was. She had something about that. And not just charisma. She had uh, well, you've got, a, got a, a glow or something about her. And she just stood out. So this is the house, which then used to be called Solomon's Island, but is now called Tor Noon. Is that how you remember it? I mean, it doesn't seem to me to have changed at all from what it was like in the film. No, it hasn't. <laughs> God. So, well, there's the, as you can see, there's the, the barn that they, d they have now finished the roof of. It took them a long time. It took them 31 years. <laughs> And that's the porch. The, the, the porch used to be there as well, but the porch was a different colour. Is that how you remember it? More water! Very much so. You know, this is one of the most important times of my life, and it will always remain so. And the memory of it is, is, is a strange one, in part, because I've made an awful lot of movies in my life. But this one, for me, often lives in my memory like a dream, like an experience. There's a gun. They hear me. I wish I had the insight I feel I have today uh, uh, because I, I, I think what I, what I could have strengthened is to take the Susan George character and I'm not sure we did that then, and to make her a trophy wife, make her something, a someone that he married, particularly so that other men and women would think that, you know, it would boost his own sexual image. When you see the couple arriving at the beginning, there's a question about whether or not their marriage is in crisis from the beginning of the film or whether during the course of the film what happens to them in that house is the thing that breaks them apart. You think that when they arrive at the house they actually have something that, that, that could survive. Oh yes I do, yes I do. It is in trouble uh, uh, from, from the go. Yes, I think we were in trouble and uh, I think uh, we were at a point in that marriage where uh, we were not connecting. Uh, <laughs> As I remember the hijinks, the sexual play, I think, <laughs> under the covers and all that. There was something infantile that we wanted. There was something that, that wasn't mature about them. I love you, Amy, but I want you to leave me alone. Here he is married to this extraordinary looking young woman, and he's not giving her anything uh, of, in terms of what she needs. He's bored and angry. She's shallow and uh, clinging. Uh, it had to break down. It was broken down before it started. I think this was two people, and especially from her point of view, um, was coming back to the roots, to an, old, to an old memory and a good memory, and to bring somebody that you love back to this place, to share it with them. Which was probably the worst thing she could have possibly done because she brought him back to her own environment. She was now in control. She was the one who knew the people. They were her friends. He knew nothing. He was a fish out of water. Here is this guy, loaded, 
supposedly clever, great scientist. He's taken our girl away. And now he has the audacity to come back. That your daddy's chair? Every chair is my daddy's chair. You, you've got a woman who's telling a man, you know, my father's much more important to me than you are. And yes, it's a marriage that is definitely on the rocks. I mean, here's a woman who comes into a town that she hasn't been to in years and walks past the window with no clothes on when she knows that there's four people on the roof staring into the window. I mean, what, what does she think she's doing? My guess is that instinctively, he wanted the Sumner character to stage this, to be as much a part of the scenario that was going to happen, and to allow her to be provocative, to allow them to be provoked, to allow what was happening. And I don't think Sam would be conscious of that. They are constantly the object of the kind of voyeuristic gaze of the other villagers, people looking in at them, and Amy kind of rises to that and sets herself up as a, a, a visual image for others to look at. I wanted to be comfortable with Amy. I didn't want to feel that I was um, on show. Yeah, I didn't want to do it in your face. I wanted to tell the public with the, by the way I walked and by the way I used my hands and by the way I put my hands through my hair and by my eyes. I, that's how I wanted to be sexy and provocative. He wanted it to be much more blatant than that. He wanted me to have naked tits and nipples that you could see through the sweater. And for me, that was really difficult to get my head around. I, I, that was, again, it was him invading my space. But he was right. It was a great visual image, an impact image, and he was right about it. And I took it on board, and I did it. He said to me, well, there was one point down there, he said, that Dell, you know, he doesn't like you. He thinks you're a shit actor. And I mean, I know that's not, you know, that's, that's a wind up. But the bottom line is that when you actually come to do a scene, there is a little engendered See, they're going, well, shit, maybe he did say that. So you go, all right, you saw him a bit. <laughs> so he'd got, uh, he'd got attention, which works for the, which worked for the film. The crew seemed to like us, and had one or two laughs, and Sam said, never laugh at the actors. Never laugh at the actors. If you laugh at them, they'll think they're funny, and they won't be funny. He had a slightly disconcerting habit. Just before a take, he'd make a strange noise or he'd shout, or he'd tell a rude joke, or whatever, just to get some reaction from the actor. If he was directing Dustin Hoffman, he'd say, Dusty, that reminds me of so-and-so, so-and-so. Do you see the point of that joke? And Dustin would laugh, and Sam would say, action, right, and get in on that mood, you know. I've worked with many, many directors, and I would say Sam is probably one of the quietest directors I've ever worked with. He would let the scene go, while it was playing good, and only if he felt something was wrong, then you'd hear the word cut. And sometimes you'd be hanging on, waiting for cut, because he wanted that little bit of extra something that was going on at the end. All I had to do was walk through a door, shut the door, walk by the camera. You know, three years at Rada, you do not need. I walked through the door and he said, God damn, fucking what kind of fucking actor do you call yourself? And you'd say, I don't know, Sam, do I walk quicker? Did I go the wrong side of the camera? Did I use the wrong hand? What? what, what? And he said, yeah, fucking goddamn asshole actors. Shit. You'd go have a little toot and come back and go, baby, I love you. That was the greatest scene I've ever seen in my life. Let's do the next one. There was one scene in the pub, I remember, which wasn't quite working. Dustin's character was supposed to walk in. We were all too supposed to react to the stranger walking into the bar, you know. It wasn't working. Dustin went out, came back in, and got his trousers on. Sam got the reaction he wanted. I think usually I went along with Sam because I felt he was coming from somewhere, even if he couldn't articulate it. I was fearful that it wasn't done in an explicit enough fashion so that it could be knocked off as just a violent movie. I believed that Sam had in him the ability to do that violent 
last 25% of the film and make it original because it so easily could have fallen into a B-picture action sequence. You get Henry Niles with his car. He's got him up at trenches. From the point of view of Tom Hedden's character, my driving force as the actor playing him was the loss of Janus and the knowledge of Niles' disappearance and the knowledge that the American is harboring him. Please, David, stop them! Don't worry! Well, it's the lone man coming into town, um, meeting the antagonists in the town who are against him because he's different. It's sort of high noon. Dustin plays Gary Cooper. <laughs> but at the time that you were shooting the stuff around the house with the production, your entire mind was on, oh. you know, being in that house. Oh, I mean, that sort of siege mentality of the film seems to, you know, completely come home. It did. Extraordinary. It did. It completely enveloped us as people and as characters, without shadow of a doubt. And I was just thinking that little tiny <laughs> lean-to that you yeah. see there, that's where the hot chocolate urns were. And we could huddle into that little bit there of an evening. That was the place to keep out of the wind. Hoffman, up the set, please. And Susan, George, urgently, lights going, need them. A lot of running around, and, and, and Sam made a lot of it up on the hoof. I mean, it, you know, he'd say, all right, break that. Smash that. Jump in that window. Do some, give me a number, give me some magic here, and you'd go, oh, Christ, you got like that. Well, I've made a statement about violence in uh, The Wild Bunch. I think it's quite uh, definitive. I'm trying to take another look at violence in this. You know, I did get beaten up. Badly, physically. It will always be better, something physical like that, on the first time through. And in Straw Dogs, nearly all the way through, it was the first time through. We moved on. We did something horrific and violent and unbelievably dangerous, and we moved on. <laughs> You hadn't give me that gun. Damn you, Major. Let go! That scene was shot in three different locations. It starts off with me grabbing the gun, and they got a stuntman. And he was put in a spring, dug into the ground, which was a hydraulic thing when released, but thrown back. And then, months later, at Fickenham Studios, uh, in one corner of the set with a cement floor, I was taken by four men and thrown on the ground. <laughs> I took off in Land's End and landed at Twickenham. <laughs> I think the road that we were treading was purely and simply to get in there and get Niles out and lynch him. David, you know it's Henry Niles? I don't want him here. He's hurt. I don't want him in my house. I think perhaps uh, Sam might have been saying everyone has a breaking point. You can be pushed only so far. Give them Niles, David. Don't beat him to death. I don't care. Don't send him out. Get him out. And all of a sudden, he is—he has to come to terms with the fact that his home, his wife, everything that is important to him is being threatened. I care. This is where I live. I will not allow violence against this house. It is a moral stance, and it's a good stance. It is the basis of, of democracy. He wanted court of law. He wanted the due process to be gone through, and he was going to protect him. I'll have an answer, or I'll have blood! I'm going to keep them out of this house. For the first time in his life, he's standing up for somebody. He wasn't able to stand up for his wife. I don't think he ever stood up for even himself, and I don't think he'd ever stood up for anyone else. But for the first time in his life, albeit a stranger, he was going to protect a stranger. 
And I think it was important that it was a stranger because it had nothing to do with Henry. It had more to do with him. Sam uh, might have been illustrating that uh, at a given point, someone will lash out. But I don't think it was necessarily identifying himself. My neck's on the glass. Good. I hope you slit your throat. When someone is pushed to the limit, he will find in himself something that he didn't know existed. As in the Dustin Hoffman character, who was basically a pacifist, he was basically cerebral, he was an intellectual, he ran away from the violence of his country. He turned out to be something he didn't know he was, until he was pushed to the limit. <laughs> He starts to compete with the men. And that's a very Sam thing, that you've got to be a man, you've got to do a man's things, you've got to go out shooting with them. He's challenged, he rises to it. Dustin Hoffman's character takes on the values of the villagers. And because of that, ultimately, he's going to lose. Because he is forced into being a violent person. And, in fact, because he's clever, he becomes a much more violent person. And horrifically violent than perhaps the guys who are threatening him. I went into Melnick's office and I said, I want coconuts. I'm not a violent person. Uh, I had never shot a gun. I'd never really gotten in a physical fight, but I th thought a lot about the stuff I was going to do. And I knew that by that point, the character was enjoying it. So I wanted to enjoy it. Now, obviously I wouldn't enjoy it hitting somebody's head, but I would enjoy kicking the shit out of a coconut. As long as you're specific, the audience then becomes the collaborator. And they're not seeing a coconut. They're seeing uh, someone up there who's enjoying, you know, bashing somebody's skull in. And I remember in one of the takes, some of the coconut came out, and I think Sam saw it in the rushes and loved it because it looked like brain matter. <laughs> What Peckinpah does is to take that story, which is in many ways a very simple story, and to throw a wild card into it. And the wild card in Peckinpah's version of the story is Amy, who's a fifth columnist. Amy, open the door and let's have miles. I won't let them hurt you. Amy is married Please, to the man who lives in that house, but is actually connected to the people on the outside. And all the way through Straw Dogs, Amy is conspiring one against the other. You don't know where her allegiances are. You know, Dustin Hoffman is in the house, they are outside the house, but Amy is both inside and outside at the same time. And that element of betrayal is unique to the script. It didn't come from the novel. It's almost certainly the touchstone that makes the film what it is, and it's peck and Damn it, I need you! Oh, God! Charlie! Why does she shout David, and why does she shout Charlie? If she'd ever had time to stop and think about it, the siege, to, and she'd analysed it, and they'd ever had a conversation about it, it would have been, this didn't need to happen. And whilst it was all going on and had all got so out of proportion, and he was being so violent all of a sudden, all of a sudden violent, at a time when she needed him to be anything but violent, especially to her, so I think for that moment when it had all gone so horribly, horribly wrong and she shouted David, she also shouted Charlie because I don't think she knew at that time who really loved her. There was one actor who pulled me down the stairs. He was supposed to pull me the big just begin and then Samuel's cut and Samuel's cut and he keeps pulling. <laughs> I went down a full flight of stairs. He was gone. The most troubling element introduced into the story of the siege of Trencher's Farm by Goodman and Peckinpah's script for Straw Dogs was a sequence in which Amy is raped, first by her former boyfriend Charlie, for whom she still seems to harbour some affection, and then by his violent cohort Norman Scutt. The novel 
is about the man. The film is about the woman, but the film's attitude to the woman is deeply problematic. Described only in outline in the script, the sequence became the cause of major anxiety for Susan George. And I wanted, very simply, to know the specifics. And I asked and I asked, and it was always brushed under the carpet, and I'd get these steely blue eyes once again that would just penetrate, and that penetrating look meant... I have nothing to say on the subject. Eventually, I said, you know, I have to take a meeting with you, Sam, and we have to talk about what you're expecting of me. Simply so I can think about how I'm going to play it. You know, the reality, the journey, making the journey, I want to make that journey in my head so that I know what I'm going to do. He finally did say, we'll have a meeting specifically about the rape scene. So I went up to his office, and he said to me, so what do you want me to do? Do you want me to write it down? So I said, if that would be easier for you, yeah, write it down. That would help. And he said, well, I'm not going to write it down. You knew when you took this movie on that there was this scene in the movie. You knew that you had to be nude for this scene. If you have any problems with it, why did you take the movie? And, of course, I said, well, because I wanted the movie. <laughs> And I wasn't going to let that stand in my way. And he said, I don't intend to tell you how I'm going to shoot it. But what I will tell you is that you're going to be naked. And what I will tell you is that two men are going to attack you. One is going to have sex with you. And the other is... No... <laughs> I don't know whether I can say that, because... You can. Everybody say it. You can, I know exactly what you're going to say. Oh, fine, all right, OK. I didn't know if I could say it on Channel 4. No, no, no. I can tell you that one man is going to have sex with you, and I can tell you that the other man is going to bugger you. And at 20 years of age, I have to say, I sat back in my chair and I said, what does that mean? And he told me what that meant. And I was terrified. It seemed to me that he was intending on this being an actual thing that was going to take place on the set. And I said, this is going to be a gangbang and I'm going to be <laughs> the sole target, <laughs> you know. Um, and I thought this was a movie and I thought we were actors. And at that point, I got up out of my chair and I said, I'm not prepared to do that, Sam. And he said, you will do it. And I said, no, you didn't hear me. I am not prepared to do that. And you must find yourself another Amy. And I stormed out of the door and slammed it behind me. A lot went on in those few days when I walked out. The big guns were called in America. There were lots of telephone conversations. It was a very, very stressful, stressful, fraught time. And I was very much alone. So... At the end of all this fracas, and indeed it was, that went on for several days, um, I was granted another meeting with him. And I knew that this would be it, yes or no. And it was in that meeting that I said to him, if you focus on my eyes, literally focus on my eyes, put your camera there and let it concentrate on my eyes, I will tell you all about this rape everything you and the audience could possibly want to know. That will be my endeavour, to convey those feelings. And that's what he said he finally would allow me the chance to offer up. Might be a little while, sir. I'll be here. David, all right? He's fine. Enjoy himself. May I come in? All right. She didn't have to invite him in. I think she was trying to pay back David for his lack of emotional and sexual support of her. David, uh, Werner came round to see me today. Why wasn't he with you on the, on the moors? I thought you guys were on a duck hunt. 
She was going to use that as a ploy to make him jealous. That her ploy, I think, obviously got out of hand. Please leave me. I've seen a lot of rape scenes in my life, but I've never seen one where the woman responded in such a way to what was happening. <laughs> She encourages it in a way by giving in and kissing the man. And she says, no, no, we've got to stop. And then so on. And pushes, and then she slaps him. Get out! And then he hits her and this... <laughs> there was a lot of slapping. And that's hard. Because you, you have to get fairly close, otherwise there's too much air. And I, I caught her once. <clears throat> um, which is... You know, it's terribly unprofessional to... And you're given marks, of course, all around the room. You've got to get it from there to there. So you rehearse that a few yeah. times. <laughs> but this give and take until finally she, she allows herself to, to, be, to be raped. Any film which peddles the notion that in under certain circumstances women can enjoy rape it's is deeply problematic and we need to talk about those problems well it's the primeval force you know when it's someone that you once had a relationship with when it's someone you once felt something for it's sort of the you know it, it's it sort of clicks on a memory Sam was so tough on me through this time. I mean, he was unbearable. He didn't speak to me. He closed down all communication. Um, from the time that I, he had agreed to do it my way, um, he was furious with me. He was livid. He couldn't have been more angry. And for the three days that we shot the rape scene, Sam Peckinpah sat on the floor beside me and never spoke a word. No! No! <sighs> It might be said that her emotional life is so impoverished that even a guy who slaps you around is going to be better than a guy who sends you out of the room and gets on with his work. He said, when they're raping your wife, just... When they start to rape her, I want to cut to you shooting the bird. I kept on remembering, you know, thinking about her age. Susan was there with all these men all the time. And it's hard for a woman, a young woman. So, uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, but I would have felt protective of any woman in that position. And Sam said to the effect, this is where he gets tender. So I just um, did what I thought was tender. The, the noises that Susan George performs, which are first of all noises of struggle, slowly metamorphose into noises of orgasmic pleasure. The simple notion that rape can be pleasurable is, is really at the heart of what's difficult about this film. I think for women as well as for men. I think she's crying because she realises this whatever she's done is going to change her life forever. This is the old um, idea that women said no when they meant yes. She says, hold me, hold me. So she's gotten something, some sort of release out of that, uh, even though she's crying and so on. I, I, I don't know where you find this one, but in Sam's head. It's more revenge against Dustin Hoffman's character than any uh, feeling of 
against her, although in fact she is assailed. But I think she's assailed primarily because it's revenge against him. That scene doesn't read as a scene of man threatening man. I don't think Charlie helps because he's threatened. I think he helps because he's the guy's friend and his world is part of this network of male machismo amongst the kind of yokel figures. No! 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 I think the complicity is the gun. I think if Venner had his way, he would have wanted Scott there. You have to find some kind of humanity in those people. You can't see them all as monsters. I remember spending most of my time sitting on Herbie Smith, who was the, the camera operator, with my legs across his stomach, giving him one at one point, because he was holding the camera. And I'm on top of Herbie going, and there's 20 crew around you going, <laughs> Herbie going <laughs> I always thought I was supposed to bugger her. I mean, I, that was always what I was told. That it, it wasn't just a normal rape. He'd rape her, turn around, and then uh, I, I was. Uh, that's why. This is why he was a despicable character. Whether it's one way or the other, to me, is totally irrelevant. Whether he took the freeway or the or, or, or the side road is it totally irrelevant to me. The impact of the second, perhaps more disturbing rape, for me, makes the first rape even more disturbing. The fact that Peckinpah can take us from supposedly good rape to bad rape is made even more difficult, I think, to watch and perhaps for Susan George to perform because we, we see a, a rape sequence in which she doesn't enjoy it. So the very notion that rape is something that can be pleasurable emerges from the conjunction of these two sequences, and I find that very problematic. Everybody had come in to see the scene from America and everywhere, and he came out of the um, rushes afterwards and um, walked across the forecourt and put out his hand to me and said, you got it. I don't know if he ever thought that she was raped, but, but I think he was an intelligent enough guy to know that with the kind of wife that he had who was driven to be that provocative with those guys, the train was on a track. And I think he was denying his knowledge of it, conscious knowledge of it, because he, want, he needed to deny that he was a participant, which I think he was. They stuck it to me on the morgue today. They also serve who sit at home and wait. What? Cut by censors on both sides of the Atlantic back in the early 1970s, Straw Dogs was later outlawed on video in the mid-80s, banned for its treatment of sexual violence. It was a ban which would remain in place until the end of 2002. That was an issue that I argued with the chief censor at great length. Initially, he gave it the worst of the ratings because he was convinced it was sodomy. So now you have the censor and an assistant and I huddled over an old-fashioned moviola running 12 feet of film back and forward and my arguing you see, if you notice the angle at which he is standing and approaching her, if you think of the physiological implications, it is clear that it is rear entry and not buggery. Uh, today, I don't think it would cause the hoo-ha that it did when the film was originally released. Sam's motivations, I don't know. But in a sense... Uh, it could have been Sam showing his disdain for the girl and his fear in his own relationships that this could have happened to him. 
I think he felt that um, it was very easy to be betrayed by women because he liked women, and so perhaps he opened himself up to them, and then when he felt that he was um, somehow betrayed, it, was, it turned to anger. He did feel betrayed, but then he did a lot of betraying. Nobody did anything to him, I don't think, in his lifetime that he hadn't already first done to them. He would love to have been able to sort of just get through life without need for women. But he needed women and he loved women, but he resented that reliance upon them. I think most creative men have a, have a virgin horror syndrome going. He was incapable of uh, building up this strong relationship with a woman, you know? I don't care who. His mother, probably, uh, his first wife, uh, all of his other wives and lovers, and uh, no. His relationship with women was very ambivalent, to say the least. I saw signs of violence. <laughs> He was more interested in guy things, carrying around a head. Think of the movies. So what are we talking about? Women? Where are the women in the wild bunch? He's, man, he's making men's movies. How he loved uh, Steve McQueen, how he loved uh, James Coburn, how he loved Warren Oates. You think he might have been a faggot? <laughs> It's such a difficult watch. I mean, I saw it, in emotions. Yeah, no, it's absolutely. Incredibly. And it incredibly. looks like the work of um, a director who is, you know, to some extent wrestling with his own demons. It's not something that you think, oh, I've got an evening free, I'll just casually no. slap on straw dogs. No, no, no. Nowadays, loads of people say to me, oh, I must get, because that's one thing I've never seen in straw dogs. I know, well, well, pick the time and the place. Don't just pick it up and go and view it. His willingness to go the distance, willing to take a chance, to try something different. That was what was characterized Sam Peckinpah to me. I think he would have been a wonderful love storyteller. All the very, very dramatic elements of this movie take over. But deep inside this film is a love story. And what do you think it says about Sam that in the case of Straw Dogs, <laughs> there is a love story that turns to a story of betrayal and violation and the breakdown of things? And, and is, is because, because he was a romantic at heart and yet he felt unbearably beaten up. And he, that's why I think he was so cruel to women and had this love-hate relationship all the time. Right. I see his face. I see his fragility. And I see that behind all of it, he wanted to be hugged. And he would have hated anybody saying that about him. If he saw this film and, <laughs> and heard me say that, he'd probably get a contract out on me. <laughs> but it's the truth. There was such a huge conflict within him. I mean, I do believe he'd have walked on water for somebody that he loved. Mm. But he also would have pushed them under. from the floor you can ask any working girl south of the border Sam Beck and Fahera un hombre for sure I said Willie oh buddy please tell me again reason to keep going on he said there's no hard words to say over a friend they've got you so righteously wrong it's not you 